the uh, the ex existing knowledge. Uh, as mentioned before, the studies uh, based on on this particular aspect have have been scanned. Uh, the study will contribute to the literatures of art and refugee studies by you know furthering our understanding of how messages uh, impact the behavior of a community of a community that's probably considered to be one of the most persecuted and ignored in the world. Uh, based on my preliminary um, reporting, uh, it has, you know, it is quite evident that affirming their um, identities through music and poetry is quite, quite central to mobilizing them. Uh, and at another level, I think these findings can, you know, help uh, direct policy attention and, you know, maybe even design more effective interventions to address the problems uh, the Rohingya face in Bangladesh and you know maybe even refugee camps in other international regions as well. Uh, yeah, so so that's it from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much um, for that. Um, really uh, inspiring presentation. Um, we're going to move um, next um, to here. Figure out how to work my computer. Virginia, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to um, the previous presentation was really interesting. Um, so I'm Virginia and connected from Italy at the moment. Uh, I today propose uh, some uh, results of recent uh, research I've been doing as a sociologist, but also strongly connected to um, anthropological methodologies. Uh, I am therefore will go through what happens today uh, to people who have experienced their life as refugees in Italy and uh, connected to their access to um, the right of education. So uh, I work in Italy as a um, uh, researcher and um, it, since 2003 I work as a um, social worker as well in reception project and um, since 2016 as project news coordinator. So um, first of all, why education? So education is of course a privileged point of view and uh, an empowering, uh, empowering right. And one of the most powerful tools through which individuals can raise themselves out of marginalization and take part in the society people live in. So as I told you, uh, I will go through um, some field observation I could collect through my eyes. I would I like to say the same eyes, but different point of view. On the one hand, the one of uh, a social worker and, um, and on the other hand, the one of a researcher. So I will borrow some flesh from three stories uh, or case studies of three students with refugee backgrounds, three citizens who are now living in Italy. I could interview in 2020. Uh, they are, these are semi-structured interviews with, uh, uh, of course, they are fake names. Uh, Ali and Joseph, Joseph are two men from uh, West Africa and what is from the corner of Africa. And she's the woman I could met in this uh, little team. So um, very briefly, um, my theoretical um, inputs, uh, I like to uh, always refer to Lydia Morris' concept of civic uh, stratification, uh, underlining the fact that today the recognition of rights no longer depends on the status of a citizen, but on the process of this classification of population in a set of status which, to which correspond rights. Therefore, citizenship can be here considered as Iwa Ong was suggested, suggest us not much as a legal category, but rather as a set of self-building practices. 
uh, I like therefore to refer to this space in between uh, where people oscillate from one right to another uh, and one, from one status to another. So in this case, from being refugees, becoming citizens and at the same time, leaving the status of citizenship and becoming refugees. Uh, and um, I propose this uh, concept of the paradox of the refugees, refugeeship. So uh, people are into this process of citizenization, which uh, is founded from the acquisition of institutionally guaranteed rights and the recognition of proximity to local society. Um, Eden and Nielsen in 2014 uh, say that it, to emphasize uh, the importance to um, underline the essential part of this struggle by insisting that what is at, is at the stake is not only the right to have rights, referring to Arendt's famous uh, statement, of course, but it's also the right to claim rights. And this is what they define the struggle for a political subjectivity to what mm, that we call citizenship. They define the uh, for mm, acts of citizenship intentional and socially relevant actions often formalized through which the subjects assert themselves as citizens. It's the case of Joseph, uh, a young social worker uh, with humanitarian protection that is now living in Italy. I could interview in 2020 and that these are the words he used to tell me when he was speaking about his feeling when he obtained a public um, uh, diploma in a public school in Italy. He said, uh, that's how I felt when I took this diploma. I was proud and above all satisfied. I was not happy, but satisfied that I had uh, achieved that goal. So the question, the key question will be, can the refugee study? Uh, before going through this question, I have to briefly show what it means to live and uh, study and become refugees in Italy. Uh, what, uh, I'm going through the, a short description of the uh, Italian refugee reception system. Um, first of all, because um, I would say that 99% of uh, asylum seekers and refugees who are living in Italy have somehow experienced uh, period of their life in a reception project. Italy is uh, strongly characterized from different typologies of camps, projects. Um, the protection system for asylum seekers and refugees that was uh, in 2002 changed in what I defined the crisis of asylum rights in 2018 the, under the government of uh, Minister Salvini. Uh, and asylum seekers and humanitarian protection were for the first time in their history excluded from these integration projects and mainly uh, welcomed in camps that were isolated with few resources and limited access to social rights with a high risk of assistentialism. So in 2020, once again, the main national project changed again. Asylum seeker are now uh, um, again inside this project, which is actually the one I, co I coordinate a small project of this system that is now named reception and integration project. But once again, asylum seekers are excluded from any type of economical uh, support to access um, what should be uh, their integration process. So while um, you are, if you are an asylum seeker in Italy, you might spend some one to three years, uh, having the possibility to access your basic needs and only language courses. Once you get a status, for example, the refugee status, then you have the possibility to access integration projects, but in six months, you should, you are supposed to obtain uh, a result. So uh, from this very, very short and simple explanation to me, the interest is to show you that uh, fundamentally, uh, the Italian refugee system is based on heterogeneity, emergentiality that promotes fragility and politics based on myopia. So uh, going back to the question, if ref the refugee can study, we have to keep in mind that asylum seekers in Italy have time, but no resources, and refugees have resources, but no time. And that, what, uh, that is actually what happened to Joseph uh, when he was uh, narrating to me what was his life um, 
it says, I was in a camp for asylum seekers, and after that, I could not access those rights that have the guys who take five years, which is the refugee status. I could not go into an integration project, so I made it by myself, of course, is integration. Um, and which is the role of reception process in the access to education? Um, once again, Joseph, when telling us what it was like to be a an asylum seeker in a camp, he says um, he could access language course, but not access in the public school, but uh, only a, 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 a school organized by volunteer inside the camp. And he says, after six months, I ask, is there no school? Um, the camp uh, volunteers aren't enough for me. So the camp social workers agreed to take me to the public school. And then the teachers told to the operators I was at, with a high level. And so I started to do the evening course for graduation, which brought him to what uh, he, at the beginning told us uh, was his success in taking the diploma, which was to me his act of citizenship. Um, of course, we cannot generalize, not all asylum seekers face the same um, path in their access to education. It's the case of Ali, a young refugee that now is working as a chef in a restaurant in Tuscany, where we live both. He says, as soon as I arrived, the first thing everyone asked me was, what do you want to do? And I immediately answered to study. And the reception people helped me a lot. They gave me positivity, positivity to move on. Once again, Waris, she said, I could only attend a language course on weekends and a computer course, but I was illiterate. Can you imagine? At the beginning, it was really hard, and I thought I would have never made it. Waris is a young social worker and refugee in Italy, but the interesting thing is that when she refers to her, her experience as asylum seekers was not in the recent time, but was more than 10 years ago. So this is a kind of small picture underlining the fact that inhomogeneity and fragmentation are strongly based and radicated in uh, Italian uh, political approach to the reception of refugees and support in their access to uh, education, which bring refugees becoming a passive recipient of aid sometimes or very often and promote speechlessness famously named by Malti. Uh, but what if the refugees speak? So Ali could find positive social workers, positive um, society that welcomes his needs. But he says, not everyone can do what I did because half of the people who have political asylum did not trust the reception people. So he's conscious about the fact that trust and mistrust are faces of the same label. Once again, Joseph, he says that he knew already that uh, nothing was easy and that he was already psychologically prepared. So this is a very important uh, issue because it's about being conscious and about what it means to become forced migrants in another country. Um, so how do refugees access education? Ali underlines that he had to go fast to move forward. And at the same time, what is, I like to quote uh, her all words. She says, I'm a particular case. The first few years, my will was to take the passport and leave. Then for some strange circumstances, it took me four years to get it, the passport. So, um, and that I said to myself, there's something that binds me to this country in this world here in Italy, which was actually also the very problematic we have with time and bureaucracy. She says, and then, in Somalia, we say, either you show up or you don't have to be there. It happens to be invisible. Someone can also make the choice to be invisible. But to me, it is not enough to be invisible. So she, they all talk about refugees agency. Um, going fast to some conclusion, Italian reception system not only promotes um, fragmentation and vulnerability, but clearly doesn't promote an, an, a culture of asylum. Um, and therefore, also the access to education becomes a fragmented result and part of this system, uh, strongly influenced by casualty, consciousness, and agency. The casualty is linked to who you are and who you meet. Let's think about the, the lucky Ali uh, had and the strong uh, abilities of Joseph in going 
over the incapabilities of the social worker. Consciousness about, consciousness about what it means to become uh, forced migrants and the necessity to uh, empower uh, his or her own agency to promote counter strategies and practices of resistance. So access to education itself becomes a counter strategy to avoid invisibility and to promote an empowering culture of asylum. So some advices uh, surely should be that promoting inequality uh, is a fundamental tool to in the access to education for refugees. And not only is fundamental to promote the protagonism of uh, students uh, and refugee agency in order to uh, strengthen an, an empowering culture of asylum. So I like to end my presentation once again with the words of Waris. She say, uh, I could go to work in a factory and have a few problems like paying the bills, paying the rent, but few problems is not for me. Also because I know that I want to be a part of this system, this container. As an asylum seeker, as a beneficiary of international protection of the reception system, I am now working in one of the reception projects. So this should be quite uh, impressing, but actually I like also to go further and say that this is not the end because uh, thank God she says also, I keep on attending high school in the evenings, so I will manage to go to university. I wonder if law or anthropology is this. Uh, sounds to me like an inspiring opportunity to not only to overcome uh, those uh, stratifications, but also those levels that um, Zesser uh, used to uh, remind us always when talking about uh, stereotyping uh, refugees in today's uh, era and experience. I think I'm in the 14 minutes. So I thank you and yeah, here for any question later. Thank you, Dr. Signorini. And I think next we are going to hear from uh, Donna. Hello everyone, my name is Donna Mozafarian. I am a graduate at York, from York University in the Master of Kinesiology program. And I'll be talking a little bit about my uh, master's thesis and research on refugee sport and uh, belonging of photo voice inquiry. So I was particularly interested in uh, refugee studies during the 2016 Syrian refugee crisis and Canada's response to um, the Syrian refugee crisis and taking in refugees. And a lot of the conversations around um, Canada exemplifying this uh, behavior and international applause, but was more so interested on what happens after the arrival of refugees and um, whether or not the settlement process continues years later. And so I was interested in looking at um, different vehicles for facilitating uh, belonging and inclusion. So ultimately, I was looking at sport um, and whether sport environments facilitate feelings of belonging among refugees and promote social inclusion. So uh, much of the refugee literature um, really tries to define um, refugees based on their displacement from uh, a homeland. And throughout history, uh, this term has been subjected to many changes of who is and isn't a refugee. And historically, especially in Canada, who has been desirable and undesirable as a refugee. And in terms of um, refugee settlement, a lot of uh, focus is placed on post-arrival and looking at um, settlement in regards to benchmarks or achievement of markers like employment, housing, as being indicative of successful settlement, um, but not much conversation about whether or not belonging is part of that process and almost separating the two into separate categories. Um, so I was really interested in looking at some bottom-up approaches and some um, on-the-ground programming 
And so in recent years, there's been more discourse and increasingly popular discourse around the role of sport in uh, settlement. So the two theoretical frameworks that I used were Maxwell et al's uh, reconstruction of Bailey's uh, social inclusion framework and Anton, Sitch, Anton Sitch's uh, belonging uh, framework or analytical um, framework for belonging. So with Maxwell et al's um, edition of Bailey's original framework, they suggest that the spatial dimension, which is responsible for reducing uh, inequities between players in a sports field um, as being the critical stage um, in facilitating social inclusion and that the rest of the um, dimensions cannot be fulfilled without this initial stage um, being met. So stage two would encompass the functional, which is the acquisition of skills and um, competencies and relational dimension being the fostering of belonging and acceptance and the power dimension being marked by um, a sense of uh, agency and control over one's own life would be the following stages. For Anton Sitch's analytical framework of belonging, Anton Sitch argues that for a very long time, much of literature, much of refugee literature has been focused on equating citizenship to belonging, and that there's too much weight placed on um, the politics of belonging and documentation and rights, and that uh, we need to begin to place equal importance on um, the agency and the individual self um, determination and being able to describe and conceptualizing their own belonging. So the methodology that I used uh, for my research was foot of voice methodology. And this was partly because I really uh, wanted to incorporate a creative aspect to my research. And also because I felt that um, it was robust in the sense that it mitigated a lot of the power dynamic between researcher and participant in that it offers a quite literally a lens for the participants to capture their perspective and then have that as the forefront of their conversation. Um, so there was three stages of data collection in which they uh, took and selected the pictures and we contextualized the photos through conversations, uh, focus groups, and then ultimately a thematic analysis of the conversations. Um, and these stages were carried out over the course of three uh, focus groups in which the participants submitted five to 15 pictures and had very loose parameters for um, taking those pictures, keywords like uh, social inclusion, belonging, and I was lucky enough to work with a soccer team that catered to newcomer um, and refugee Eritreans. And I worked with six, six participants who were all refugees born in um, Saudi Arabia before they migrated to Canada and who had lived um, in Canada between two to 10 years and were between the ages of um, 18 to 25 years old. So just a little bit of a historical context um, about the Eritrean diaspora. Eritrea's borders were established in 1869 during the Scramble for Africa, which was the occupation division and colonization of African countries by European countries, and was declared officially as an Italian colony in 1889. Uh, mass displacement occurred when Emperor, the Emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, sought to annex Eritrea as Ethiopia's 14th province in 1962. The war for independence in intensified in the mid 1970s, causing mass displacement and with an estimated 20,000 and 30,000 Eritreans seeking refuge in Saudi Arabia and Sudan respectively. Um, so in reality, um, Eritrean refugees were actually the second largest um, number of refugees admitted into Canada in 2016, uh, second to Syrian refugees, but very little was known, especially with the media flurry about this population. And they really uh, went under the radar there are currently 13,000 Canadians that have Eritrean ancestry living in Canada. So when it came to the data, it was very interesting for myself as it really provided a context for how the participants constructed their own identity and belonging. All of the participants were uh, male and their experiences pre-migration uh, provided really great insight for how they understood their own belonging uh, once uh, upon arrival in Canada. 
So often when we think about the refugee experience, we view it as sort of a linear process in which an individual is displaced from a homeland um, or their family is, or a family is displaced from a homeland and um, they seek refuge in a host country. They may spend some time in a in transition um, or a transit country, but ultimately it seems very linear. However, in the case of these participants, what was really interesting is that because they were born in Saudi Arabia, they were instantly labeled as refugees upon birth. So even if um, they hadn't experienced that conflict, um, they inherited their parents or some of them, their grandparents displacement, um, even though they had never uh, taken on that migration themselves. And this was ultimately because they could never gain citizenship in Saudi Arabia. And this phenomenon of inheriting that displacement, um, I decided to coin as intergenerational displacement just to make it easier as it's a very pronounced theme throughout the, the data. The participants even acknowledged that their experiences might be unique, explaining that they know it was, it sounded kind of weird, uh, but it, or that it was atypical com compared to normative assumptions about uh, refugee experiences. And so we'll talk a little bit more about how this affected their ideas of nationalism and their disenfranchisement um, in terms of living in Saudi Arabia. So their intergenerational displacement or this phenomenon uh, was really apparent in um, their ideas of authenticity around identity. And so much so that it really affected even the smallest of things. So in this picture, we see a traditionally Eritrean coffee pot, also known as a jibena. And um, the participants talked about how those that drink their um, coffee dark are considered to be really, really Eritrean. And the participants all said that they themselves and their peers um, took their coffee diluted with um, sugar and cream. And so it was almost very symbolic of how precarious this identity was that the more cream and sugar added into the cup, uh, the more the dilution of the attachment and proximity to the motherland. So while Anton Sitch really warns against equating belonging to um, citizenship or documentation, as it can uh, be reductionist and take away from an individual's um, agency, the participants in the study really felt that without citizenship and without that documentation, they were being held back um, and in a stagnant position. And this was really much, uh, very much informed by their experiences in Saudi Arabia. So in this picture, we see one of the participants, Yassine, who hired a professional photographer to take this picture because he had just landed his first job in Canada and felt the need to celebrate and mark this milestone as he felt it wouldn't be possible without the rights guaranteed to him as a documented refugee. So really we can see how um, the process of granting and claiming belonging is much more complicated and very much informed by pre-migration experiences as participants saw Canada as a meritocracy due to the fact that they were able to progress in different institutions such as academic institutions um, and ultimately since citizenship was achievable for them that they felt that they would eventually be um, equal to a Canadian born citizen. But in Saudi, the experience was that there was always a limit to what you could achieve, um, as you would always remain um, a refugee and you could never uh, live up to what was possible for a Saudi citizen. So in this picture, we have one of the participants, Amir, who um, uh, presented this picture of him graduating from high school. And this was uh, important to him to share because it showed that he was able to um, progress in his academic pursuits and eventually um, continue into college. Um, but participants talked about how due to the fact that they were restricted in Saudi Arabia on an institutional level, their ability to claim belonging uh, was rejected. So there was conversations around back home and then self-correcting and saying, well, not back home, but I was born there. Um, so this really challenges Anton Sitch's idea of personal um, claiming a belonging in agency when in reality, um, what, to what extent can personal belonging go when the agency or when this nation state is constantly reminding you that um, you are merely tolerated um, rather than wanted. In Canada, they felt that their desire to claim belonging was validated through um, being able to progress within the institutions and the labor market. And so we can really see how the power dynamics between institution and individual are pronounced um, in that scenario. 
when it comes to social belonging uh, within the soccer environment or the team itself, uh, participants felt that they were able to foster their relationships with one another, um, but also outside of the soccer field and everyday interactions. Anton Sitch believes that um, everyday interactions, which he calls micropublics, are not enough to foster a sense of belonging and that they're insignificant. But due to the fact that participants had faced um, extreme social exclusion in Saudi Arabia to the point that they would be isolated or alienated if they um, let it be known that they were actually Eritrean. They felt that these everyday interactions with Canadian citizens and strangers were extremely valuable and um, meaningful to them. So the ethno specificity, bit of a tongue twister of the soccer team, um, participants felt that it was a great place for them to uh, feel less lonely. A lot of them had embarked on their migration without family uh, and were living alone in Canada. And uh, really connected with each other through these shared experiences and cultural and religious commonalities. So we have a Quran here in the picture, an incense burner and the coffee pot mat uh, for the Jibana. So there was a, a lot of unspoken understanding of these uh, shared cultural um, items and um, very much things that they all had um, in common. So in terms of the social inclusion framework, what the framework uh, fails to uh, account for is that skill level could pose a barrier to participation. So one of the participants, Yassine, talked about how his brother actually dropped out of the soccer team because he felt that he wasn't as skilled as the other players and he was holding them back. They also talked about how um, their unfamiliarity with sports outside of soccer would prevent them from wanting to participate and that they felt uh, when it came to sports like basketball that they needed more time to acquire those skills in order to participate on a more organized level. There was also a lot of conversation, interestingly enough, around um, the culture around soccer and what the framework um, for social inclusion fails to account for is that not all sport may uh, facilitate the same type of, type of reaction amongst participants. So there was a lot of conversation about how uh, other sports had a sense of um, hubris that soccer didn't and that soccer had a unique sense of humility and sportsmanship. So one of the pictures here we have is of a medal that one of the participants brought, um, Ali, and Ali stated that this was not his favorite medal, that he felt it was cheaply made, he was not particularly proud of it, and so when I asked why he had decided to take a picture of it then, he said, well, I don't want to be a show off. So again, this idea that um, soccer had a special culture of uh, humility and um, was more about being respectful and about being a team player. In terms of the functional dimension, um, the sports environment was a, a place in which uh, newer refugees could access information about processing times by speaking with those who had spent, um, who had been through that process already and who had spent a uh, longer time in Canada to gain information about employment, education, and housing. Um, it also provided a place for them to become familiar with things like Canadian slang and slang in the Toronto area, um, which they felt impacted their conversations um, with other Canadians. So in terms of the relational dimension, participants felt that um, the ethnospecificity of the team really allowed for them to um, have that commonality and shared experience with each other and foster relationships. In terms of the power dimension, um, Participants testified that um, participating in soccer made them feel as if they had control over their lives and ever since they started playing that they felt more structured in their lives. So in conclusion, I found that the data really challenged um, Anton Sitch's analytical framework in that um, while it, it having personal agency and emphasizing personal agency may have its merit, um, we really have to take into context pre-migration experiences. Also, um, not all sport may be conducive to social inclusion and that we really have to consider attitudes and perceptions towards a sport before introducing it in sports programming. So recommendations for future studies would be to consider pre-migration conditions as I uh, spoke about and also that ethno-specific teams could be helpful um, in providing a stepping stone for um, new refugees. Uh, consideration for skill level and the type of sport being played and cultural attitudes around sport should be um, considered. 
thank you for listening and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, that was so interesting. Um, I think I'm next. So Mm. Okay, I think that's going to work better. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm going to talk about um, some research that I'm involved in also using photo voice and I have too much here. So I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit selective about what I focus on here. And the first thing I want to do is just sort of go over this diagram because I think one of the most um, interesting things about this research is just the, the kind of um, relationships um, and the sort of um, the, the move from sort of one, it's a community-based project and it's been a real learning process. Um, and so this is a research that kind of picks up on uh, previous research I did with the Central Central American Youth in Canada on their experiences of schooling and belonging in Toronto. And this sort of maps the trajectory of the projects. Um, so at the top, if you can see, it's sort of like a start and end uh, map um, with a graduate student from G uh, Giovanni Carranza from York, um, who uh, we approached the Hispanic Development Council and began community consultations. And so you can see that um, uh, we collaborated with this um, community organization to um, and, com and consulted with the community to help um, us shape our um, project um, and our approach. And so what we wanted to look at was um, basically just an inductive study at the experiences of the 1.5 and second generation um, so-called refugees from Central America. They're the children of refugees from Central America. In some cases, they came as young children, but they all grew up mostly in Toronto. Um, and Veronica Escobar also joined us during one of the community consultations. And we did a number of interviews. Um, and then through the community consultations decided that we would adopt the approach of photo voice and that's kind of where we are now. Um, so we use snowball sampling. I'm going to talk a little bit mostly about the photo voice a little bit about the interviews. Um, so I mean a very quick review of the literature. Um, you know Central Americans arrived in Canada primarily as refugees in the 1980s and 1990s, carrying the trauma of civil war as they fled. The majority have settled in major urban centers in Canada and have faced racism, discrimination, loss of socioeconomic status. Um, because of restrictive migration policies, there's also an issue of precarious status among the community. Um, and you know, there's been a number of studies that look at this sort of settlement process that extends to the next generation. And we didn't seek to do uh, research on trauma, but trauma emerged from our interviews um, as, a, as an important topic, as well as from the photo voice that we did. Um, 
research shows high stress levels and mental health illness among Central Americans in Canada. Um, and that Latin Americans in general um, have negative experiences of mental health services. We also note structural inequalities around education that Latin Americans are more educated than the average yet get low returns on their education. And also a high uh, dropout rate among um, Latin American students in secondary school. And of course, um, they face racist stereotypes, marginalization, low expectations um, for their, um, their schooling. Um, some research has sort of looked into the process of identity formation and belonging, um, and also um, resilience. Um, for instance, Carranza's study looks at um, the way in which uh, mothers instilled cultural heritage in their daughters as a means of facing racism, facing systemic racism, and you know, developing a sense of belonging. Um, and study I did looked at sort of how male use buffered the racism and marginalization uh, through forming multi-ethnic friendships and hybrid ethno social identities. And so really, I mean, the a lot of the research on communities like Salvadorans is plagued by a kind of deficit approach. And so um, we wanted to sort of, um, you, you know, approach the community and find out in um you know disturb those power relations and find out from youth you know how what how did they view their um their sense of belonging in canada what what were their the experiences that they wanted to emphasize and uh, our interviews came up with the following themes and i just kind of put these together in a diagram to try and think about some of these relationships the trauma they experienced in canada as well as intergenerational trauma as well as the um, this notion of resilient families and also another theme of kind of self-sufficiency or self-determination that emerged from the interviews um, and i'm going to go through these fairly quickly because i want to get to the photo voice project but um, among the the sort of indicators of intergenerational intergenerational trauma are family violence Um, another one, silence about the past and mental illness. So uh, parents, you know, not um, being open to talking with their children about the war in many cases, uh, not in all cases, and also a sort of stigma around mental health. Also, because parents were often working a number of jobs, and negotiating immigration process and other stresses, uh, they weren't as available to their children um, as, um, as others were. And then the theme of self-sufficiency, um, which came across uh, strongly from the participants, um, you know, feeling like they couldn't trust anyone, that they had to not to rely on anyone and had to sort of um, be independent. Another strong theme, uh, you know, the community and cultural identity, how important uh, community was both in terms of um, uh, finding support as well as giving back to the community and contributing to that community. So um, I want to just now look at one photo voice project. There's a media exhibit of, of eight photo voice projects that you can um, find on the website. I encourage you to go there. Um, and this one, it's interesting, um, in the last presentation, the, the picture of the, um, you know, the graduation, this is, again, was very um, uh, prominent in, in a number of the photo voices was, you know, the issue of education and, um, and graduating from uh, high school and university. So this participant, I'm going to read some of the um, text that went along with the photo voice projects. I was raised with parents willing to sacrifice, willing to risk it all for a chance for a better life. That's why I'm proud to say I was raised by Salvadorian parents in an immigrant home. Every day my mom would walk me out the door and tell me, que diosito me la acompaña y galde. May God accompany you and take care of you, along with póngase las pilas. 
which the literal, literal translation is put the batteries. And that's just what I did. Me puse las pies. I put the batteries like my mom told me to do. I became the first person in my family to graduate from post-secondary in 2011. Not only did I get my bachelor's of social work, but I continued to get to pursue my master's of social work. So this picture captures the proud day of the participant graduating from university and standing in front of the door where their mother would send them off every day and tell them, póngase las pies. Um, so, you know, we saw from the, the sort of literature and also from some of the, the interviews, you know, that there was a lot of challenges. So while the parents may frequently be absent because they are working multiple jobs, um, you know, didn't have the same opportunities as their children educationally, um, they can, they motivate their children by modeling hard work and perseverance. The family pulls together the children, you know, try hard at school not always for themselves, but for their family to make the sacrifices their parents made worthwhile. So this one on transnationalism, sort of drawing then again on this notion of uh, resilient families. Um, so this part, the participant says, to me, all three of these pictures represents home. When I get to experience the Salvadoran culture. When I go to visit my family, I get the same feeling when I stare at the Toronto skyline. To me, they are both my homes. El Salvador is my home, away from home. It is part of my identity. I was raised in an immigrant home. I became a translator at the age of seven years old. Um, I did not mind. My folks used to buy calling cards to stay connected with family back home. So there's an extensive literature on identity formation, um, you know, as a complex process. There are various arguments about, you know, conflicted identities or um, finding themselves between two cultures, belonging to neither, or developing hybrid identities. Um, there's also awareness of generational differences in identity formation, um, and also, you know, differences related to at what age um, people arrive in Canada. So using a transnational lens, our data suggests that for the 1.5 and second generation, maintaining a connection to family in El Salvador, um, you know, as well as visiting and hearing stories about their homeland is likely an important factor in resilience. It can provide a sense of belonging, a positive identification, and can be a source of pride. So ethnic pride was a number, another important um, theme, both from the interviews as well as the photo voice. So the participant said, I was raised with pan dulce and cafecito, pupusas, arroz con frijoles, queso, platano frito, y crema, and tortillas. I was raised with, and then she goes on to talk about sort of various nursery rhymes um, and mythology from her culture. You see, I was raised with the same traditions my parents were raised with. Only difference was the country and city. That is me in the picture smiling in my typical clothing sent from El Salvador. Most of these traditions will be passed on to my children when I have them. I am proud of these traditions and I'm thankful to my parents for passing them down. So Milna Caranza found that it was important for Salvadorans in Canada to develop a sense of ethnic pride to counter, counter the negative stereotypes and racism they face in Canadian society. Our participant talks here about how proud she is of her culture, cultural traditions, including foods, mythology, and clothing. The traditions give her a sense of belonging that also motivates her to want to pass them on to her future children. Being committed to family and the community is an important value that allows for the transmission of her culture from her parents to her and then to her children. So the participant says in relation to this photo voice entry, to me, it was important to show up and represent Latinx women. I actually ran into different Spanish speaking groups during the march and we marched together. We made our voices stronger by marching together. We even raised concerns for issues concerning our own countries that day. 
I think it's important we show up for our communities and help encourage each other, support each other so we can prosper as a community together. I don't think I would be where I am and who I am today without the help of my community. I was raised, unfortunately, watching families get separated through deportation. I was raised watching individuals struggle to assimilate in a new country. C, I was born with a double identity. I was raised aware of race relations. I was raised to be humble. I was raised to give back. I was raised as a member of this community. So the, the participants imagine future is therefore not only one of carrying on traditions, but also one invested in social change. In our initial interviews, participants shared many memories about their experiences growing up in Canada. And there were similarities as the children of refugee parents who carried trauma from the war, being stereotyped at school, but also very variations um, in terms of having at least one parent, usually their mother who was there for them in important ways, sometimes not being close with extended family in Canada and El Salvador, and sometimes not, and having important community supports or not. We, we need to be careful in our analysis because those who don't have supports growing up sometimes become the greatest contributors of their community. As one second generation 23-year-old woman explains, just seeing the position I was in when I was a kid, I just wanted to be someone I could have had when I was younger, like a support, someone to talk to, someone to understand, what I'm going through, so I just want to be someone I needed when I was younger because I never had that. So to conclude, the second generation faces unique challenges in Canada. Trauma is passed down from one generation to the next through violence, silence, and absence. The second generation also faces racism and stereotyping at school and elsewhere in Canada, which can be traumatic, especially when there are problems at home. Resilience is greatest when at least one parent models and encourages their children to go after their dreams, no matter how difficult that may be. Children who develop a positive identification with their cultural background, including learning their traditions, speaking Spanish at home, and staying in touch with extended family in El Salvador, reciprocate by helping their parents whenever they can and getting involved in their communities in Canada and abroad. They find meaning and a sense of belonging by striving to succeed and contribute to their families and communities and imagining a better home. The main theoretical contribution of this study is the finding of how the second generation managed to bridge the cultural divide between the collective values they grew up with at home and the individual values they experience at school and in wider Canadian society. As one of our participants stated, it isn't necessary to label and define yourself in just one way. Have an open mind. Canadian values and Salvadoran values, they're very different, but that's how you learn and keep changing. So second generation Salvadoran youth are breaking into the professions in Canada, working with the community whenever they can, drawing strength from their cultural values. The importance of hard work and of family, persevering in the face of difficulty, as well as adopting values they have absorbed in Canada, being self-sufficient, driven to succeed, and they are initiating dialogues about issues that were rarely discussed by the previous generation, such as trauma and mental health. Their managed future also involves wider social changes, as evidenced by their participation in social movements, such as this Women's Day March, which is not separate from their commitment to their communities. And just leave with that last slide. This was a photo voice entry showing the, uh, you know, the front steps to this woman's home where her mother sent her off to school and said, Ponga se las pias. We out here changing the statistics of Latinx student dropout rates. Thank you very much. Thanks, Morgan. I'll just jump in now with the last presentation here. Um, my name is Erin Glanville and I'm coming to you from Vancouver. Um, at the University of British Columbia. Today, um, actually I'm in East Vancouver on Coast Salish territories currently. Um, and today I wanted to read uh, a paper that stitches together sections from two forthcoming publications on pedagogy. Um, one is entitled, What Happens to a Story? Encountering Imaginative Humanitarian Ethnography in the Classroom. I'll just actually put the link in the chat for the forthcoming multi-author vol volume that's going to be published in uh, called Opening Up the University, Teaching and Learning with Refugees. And then the other is entitled uh, Refugee Narrative Pedagogy, 
a cultural refugee studies approach. And that's being submitted and reviewed um, and it's gonna be published in the Rutledge Handbook of Refugee Narratives, which is an in-process publication. So this, what I'm about to read now comes from kind of stitching together pieces from both, both publications. And um, they're both concerned with refugee narratives in the classroom um, and also refugee narratives in informal education contexts. So I would begin by just saying that refugee narratives enjoy significant cultural capital. Um, they're at the center of many lesson plans and refugee studies. And I've seen this in um, a sort of review that I'm currently doing of K to 12 educational resources here in BC. Um, but I also see it when I'm speaking with colleagues across disciplines that a lot of people use story and storytelling um, as a method both uh, for research, but also for um, teaching. Um, and they have a central role for good reason. Research uh, shows that um, narrative have persuasive power. And so it stands to reason then that they can teach refugee realities in transformative ways for non-refugee learners. Uh, however, refugee education and teaching refugee studies, um, which are two things I wanna actually keep distinct in um, my co our conversation today. So refugee education is teaching refugees and refugee studies is teaching uh, about refugees. Um, this, this work in Canada takes place within a broader political context. Governmental and humanitarian concerns have really thoroughly shaped not only which refugee narratives are widely available or distributed, but also the pedagogies that we use and that are kind of functioning in popular spaces around refugee narratives. And consumer culture and Western paternalism is constantly shaping the interpretive practices of learners in my classrooms and in the classrooms of others that I've spoken with. So my contention is that educators who want to cr reflect critically on their pedagogy for teaching with refugee narratives, we face at least two challenges. The first challenge is that we need to teach learners to recognize and read beyond the prevalent nationalist and humanitarian frames that are currently operating uh, in popular cultural as well as in the classroom. The second challenge that we face is uh, knowing how to leverage the capabilities and at the same time, and probably even more importantly, respect the complexities and limitations of narratives for teaching refugee studies in diverse classrooms. And I slow down that sentence because I think each of the three phases in that sentence is an entire research area, an entire discussion to be had. So how to develop pedagogies for teaching narratives is one sort of area where a lot of scholars um, uh, confer and, and think about uh, together how to teach refugee narratives or sorry, narratives. But then there's also developing pedagogy for teaching refugee studies through narratives, which is another whole area uh, for study. And then thirdly, developing pedagogy for teaching refugee studies through narratives, but in diverse classrooms. And by diverse, I'm prim primarily thinking of classrooms that cross over refugee education and refugee studies. In other words, those places where both refugee and non-refugee learners are present. How do you do that well? So um, considering pedagogy then, these, these two um, uh, publications are considering pedagogy for this very specific but common space. And I think it's a really complex project. And I feel like I'm sort of just at the beginning of trying to work it out. Um, the research that I'm that I have written this out of comes from um, informal education um, context as well as formal um, university, high school, and graduate courses. So um, both of the publications are then referring to, um, that I'm referring to today, are responding to a pattern of reading and interpretation related to refugee narratives. And these patterns have coalesced in my thinking to constitute a reading practice that I refer to in the first um, uh, publication that's linked there as um, uh, imaginative humanitarian ethnography. And I use the term imaginative humanitarian ethnography or IHE to describe a way of engaging creative refugee narratives as if reading were a search for hidden knowledge of quote unquote, the refugee experience. It's a search that's motivated by and a search, uh, search results that are interpret, interpreted within humanitarian frames. And it's a learning method in which the reader imagines themselves an amateur anthropologist who can 
quote unquote, discover refugee culture in imaginative texts and then turn it into actionable knowledge. And these kinds of readings are motivated by the question often by these questions, what is it like to be a refugee? Um, what can I do to help? What can be done? And induces these emotional statements about privilege, difference, and the importance of humanizing. Narratives about refugee lives are often read by students in my classrooms in this way as well, as a form of imaginative, imaginative humanitarian ethnography. And it requires a really um, sort of intentional pedagogy to push back against this tendency um, in our interpretive and reading practices. What, I mean, I've written extensively about the issue that I find or take with this approach, but I'll just say a few things here, just that I think that this approach can limit the critical interventions of specific refugee narratives, because learners are treating refugee narratives as interchangeable, like as a, as a category in and of themselves. Um, interpreting them for predetermined learning outcomes, such as what is it like to be a refugee? Um, under, underestimating the meaning making role of rhetoric and genre, sort of the aesthetic craft. Um, privileging etic interpretations of emic narratives. So a sort of external objectification, even in the reading that goes unnoticed because of the way we think about art and and reading as a highly um, personal and equitable practice. Um, and also reinstates uneven social relationships, both in the classroom and between non-refugee reader and textual testimony. I think that this, this sort of practice is at least in part a product of the cultural capital of humanitarian his storytelling in the global refugee regime. So the way that it gets used by humanitarian, humanitarian organizations for their institutional uh, mandates um, or to support their institutional mandates. But I think this reading practice also um, has been, I would say, nurtured by the role of the arts in citizenship, democracy and human rights education um, and scholarship on that kind of education. And so um, I suppose in part I'm taking issue with the way that we um, that the way that we insert the arts into this kind of education. So you can read more about that term and also some of the examples that I give uh, in the chapter on encountering IHE. But for now, I just wanna briefly summarize the responses that I offer to these dilemmas in my two um, publications and then, um, and then we'll leave it there. So I wanna frame this work as the work of countering um, in the introduction to the book, Countering Displacements, my co-authors and I use the term counter to describe the coming together of regeneration and critique. Similarly, the work of countering imaginative humanitarian eth ethnography requires both critique, which I've offered now, as well as regeneration. And so that's what I wanna look towards now. Um, there's an invitation, I think, to a different pedagogical approach to reading and learning with refugee narratives that um, is opening up in this moment of interest uh, around refugee narratives. Um, and I think the, the, the way forward that I am, or the, the way that I'm moving forward is just thinking about um, what does a pedagogy look like that asks, um, how do we respect a narrative's vulnerability? Um, and here I'm thinking of vulner vulnerability. Oh, sorry, I just, <laughs> I jumped there because I think someone's, I'll just mute. Um, uh, a pedagogy that's what kind of learning practices respect a narrative's vulnerability. So here I'm thinking about vulnerability to interpretation by readers and educators. I'm also thinking about vulnerability to the complex processes of publication and circulation and, um, and review and reading communities. Um, and so there are two there are two different sort of possibilities for regeneration that I'm exploring. The one uh, in the first step uh, publication, I'm trying to counter imaginative humanitarian ethnography by looking closely at the way that reading practices have been impacted by consumerism and paternalism. And instead, I'm trying to recast stories as gifts and invite readers to consider the exchange of stories as part of the gift economy, rather than as part of the knowledge economy, information economy, um, or what have you. So to think about it as operating within a gift economy. And I developed that framework in conversation with Joanne Archibald's scholarship on story work, and also with the um, some interview uh, footage that I have uh, 
um, interviews that I've conducted as part of my Warren Words research project with Sharmarki Dubo, who um, is a city councillor in the city of Victoria. So that's the first, and I've um, and if you want to read more on that, that's the extended piece will come out in that publication. But the first is to to consider how we might teach if we consider uh, narratives as part of the gift economy in the classroom. And then the second um, the second uh, way that I'm trying to counter um, imaginative humanitarian ethnography is by looking at how a cultural refugee studies pedagogy can frame stories as more than reports on life as lived and thinking instead of stories as layered sites of intervention. So in other words, it's an approach to teaching narratives that's recognizing that any given narrative is always intervening in or at least in conversation with already existing narratives of forced migration. And that when we take a narrative and read it on its own without considering the matrix of relationships that it's within, we actually do a disservice both to our ability to interpret as well as the story's um, ability to communicate. So my proposed um, cultural refugee studies pedagogy then reads stories of forced migration as sites of intervention. And I'm thinking here not as intervention only as aesthetic or moral objects, but also um, thinking about the complex layers that make up a site that you might study. And so considering a narrative or a, a novel or a poem as a site with many complex layers um, that we dig into as we begin studying it. So for instance, we might have the recounting uh, of a person's particular experiences and the narrative form that's chosen to communicate those experiences, and then the way that that encounters a listening or reading public, sometimes a public with um, uh, experience and connections to the story, sometimes no frame of reference. And this encounter takes place within the local context of neighborhoods, schools, provincial policies, cultural communities, and panning out even further, the encounter with a narrative takes place within the larger context of the global refugee regime, including key actors such as nation states and humanitarian organizations. So these are some of the layers of power and relationship, policy, law, and culture within which stories of forced migration teach what any kind of art teaches. So um, beginning with this assumption that refugee cultures, refugee narratives are pointing to something more than a one-to-one -one correspondence with the human experiences of displacement, and yet also acknowledging that they do invite an analysis that's grounded in the politics of that experience. So in this second chapter, I consider this sort of challenge or this problem um, by asking three entangled questions. What do refugee narratives teach? How do refugee narratives teach? And how are refugee narratives taught? And I see those as three really different questions. So to understand what and how refugee narratives teach, we might ask who has produced the narrative, under what institutional mandates, using what methods of production, uh, under what conditions and in what context has it been circulated? How has it been used to further particular arguments or ideologies? What aesthetic and rhetorical traditions is it in conversation with? To develop uh, a pedagogy for teaching refugee narratives, which is the question of how are they taught, we might ask who is the learner, who is the teacher, where and for what purpose are narratives being taught, and so on. So that's a really brief summary of these two longer publications that are trying to offer a, a counter to the popular pedagogy of imaginative humanitarian ethnography. Um, and so I'm really eager to hear comments, questions, or also in the chat to see, hear of any resources that you know of people and uh, researchers who are moving in a similar direction to this. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, Aaron and um, other the other speakers for um, really interesting presentations. I we have about ten minutes, and um, so we can take questions, comments from the audience, uh, or um, questions and comments of, um, about each other's presentations if we have time. So um, I guess. 
I'll keep and I'll invite people just to um, to um, ask their questions through the chat or um, otherwise. In the meantime, when while you're sort of um, getting organized to to um, ask uh, questions or make comments, I I'll just say that. I think it was really an interesting collection of presentations that looked at both the agency of refugees through things like art, stories, and narrative, as well as at the kind of structures and power relations within which um, people um, are enacting their agency. So, um, I, I'll keep my comments there. <laughs> That's all I'll say, but um, yeah, I, um, I'm just wondering if we do have, I think I do see 14 participants, but I'm having a little trouble with my screen um, and I hope I'm not missing any. So I don't see any questions in the chat, but um, maybe I'll ask our support person, um, are, are people able to ask questions like by turning on their cameras or just using their mic? That are audience members able to do that? Uh, yeah, the audience can okay. uh, use their mics to just ask questions if they have any. Yes. Okay, great. So, so I'll invite people to either use the chat or or um, or just jump in um, and and make any uh, comments or ask any questions that you'd like. Um, hearing no questions and seeing none in the chat, then I guess I would invite uh, our, do the, do any of the presenters want to make any comments or, or ask questions of, um, of uh, other presenters on the panel? Okay. Well, then I guess I will, um, Aaron, are you coming back on because you want to ask a question or? Well, no, we've got, I mean, we've got four minutes, so I don't know if it's worth asking, but I was just going to say that um, uh, right now I'm sort of teaching first years using this um, word belonging. That's the sort of um, the matrix that we're looking at um, refugee uh, cultures through. And so I was, I was just interested in hearing actually if Morgan and Donna had different ways of sort of um defining belonging but i actually see that someone has put something in the chat so why don't we answer that question uh donna can answer that question yeah i just noticed that um donna can you see the question and then maybe you could also talk about belonging a little bit um in relation to aaron's comment do you want to come on on gender in the soccer team sure so thanks for your question um stephanie so i think it was um the gendered aspect was there in terms of um the sports space was catered to uh, young men, um, young Eritrean men, and um, there hasn't quite been as much of a establishment for um, girls and women in, in sport, I would say. There are a few teams, but there, there wasn't, um, I believe they were just beginning to um, have conversation about uh, starting a sports team for, for girls, uh, for Eritrean refugees. So I think that's in the works currently. Um, but, you know, it, it, the, I wish I really did have an opportunity to, to you know, um, talk to some uh, Eritrean women and girls just to see what the experience was. Uh, but a lot of these young men were embarking on their own journeys. So they had arrived without family um, on their own, um, some of them just with a sibling. So um, I, I, it's difficult to have that um, 
have that piece when I couldn't really compare between uh, both uh, male and uh, female uh, refugees. So I would say I, I don't, because I don't have much of an insight in that in that regard, I can't comment too much, but I'm sure there's something something there to be investigated, hopefully in the future. Um, in terms of belonging, so um, that's something that I, I felt uh, was really interesting in terms of going into the research project because I found myself really aligned with the analytical framework that um, you know citizenship doesn't and documentation doesn't guarantee uh, belonging and that it really is a personal um, concept and that maybe we're too focused on um, citizenship and um, I found that the data really surprised me and that it really is honestly dependent on any pre-migration experiences or any um, experiences um, before embarking on, on a journey. And especially for the population I was working with, I think there was always contention with the Eritrean identity just based on the fact that they had a war for independence and there was this constant struggle to um, have that identity, to be allowed to have a, a separate identity. So um, yeah, it, it's such a, a nuanced topic that I, I think it really can can vary, but I would say that both uh, are equally important, but also it's very obvious that um, we need to account for the structures and the institutional powers because in reality, how far can personal belonging or the, the desire to belong really go without- Let's those? end there, Donna. I don't want you to get cut off by the machine. Okay, but yes. <laughs> thank you so much. I think you rounded it off beautifully there. Thanks everyone for showing up. Um, and uh, and yeah, for participation and um, and for um, our support person um, in Saskatchewan. Um, thank you everyone. Oh, and now they're not gonna cut us off. <laughs> <laughs>